With that, I'm going to turn things over to Liz Clark. Liz, please go ahead. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us today for the Secure Pork Supply Plan webinar. Our speaker today is Dr. Pam Zabel. Dr. Zabel is an Iowa native growing up on a farm with hogs, sheep, and row crops. She earned her BS and DVM from Iowa State University in 1993 and 1997, respectively. Pam worked in a mixed animal practice for nine years and then as the Director of Swine Health Information and Research at the National Pork Board. She has been a veterinary specialist at the Center for Food Security and Public Health at Iowa State University for seven years. Pam currently leads the Secure Pork Supply Plan, which involves business continuity guidance in the event of a foot and mouth disease, classical swine fever, or African swine fever outbreak. Projects include anything pig. So I will turn it over to Pam. Thank you very much. I'm excited to talk with you today about the activities of many members of the pork industry along with members of academia and state and federal officials in developing the Secure Pork Supply Plan. I'm going to give a brief overview of the diseases included in the Secure Pork Supply Plan, which are foot and mouth disease, or FMD, classical swine fever, CSF, and African swine fever, or ASF. I will touch on the changing response plans give an overview of the Secure Food Supply Plans, and then talk more in depth about the Secure Pork Supply Plan. The Secure Pork Supply Plan is one of several Secure Food Supply Plans funded by USDA APHIS. The National Pork Board also provided funding for the Secure Pork Supply Plan. Dr. Danelle Bickett Weddle presented the Secure Milk Supply Plan a couple months ago to your group. Secure Milk was the first of the three Secure Food Supply Plans to be funded, and it focuses on milk movement. The Secure Pork Supply Plan was funded next, and it's the first to focus on the movement of live animals. More recently, the Secure Beef Supply Plan um, has been funded, and it focuses um, on the, the movement of animals from the feedlot to the packing plant at this time. And Dr. Bickett Weddle again presented the Secure Beef Supply Plan to your group last month. We collaborate on all three of these plans to ensure uniformity um, when the plans whenever possible. The Secure Milk and Secure Beef plans both address FMD outbreaks, whereas Secure Pork addresses FMD as well as CSF and ASF. I'd like to go over a little bit more information about the three diseases included in the plan. Foot and mouth disease, or FMD, is a very contagious disease of cloven hoof animals including pigs, cattle, sheep, and goats. Some people refer to FMD instead as hoof and mouth disease because it is an animal disease and not a food safety or public health issue. When a pig becomes infected, it could develop blisters or vesicles on the feet, the snout, or sometimes in and around the mouth or on the teeth. Because of these lesions, animals may be lame, have a fever, go off feed, lay around, and not want to nurse their piglets. I think it's important to remember that there have been nine outbreaks in the U.S., with the last one occurring in 1929. So, I mean, it's been many years since the last outbreak, but we must remember that FMD is still a threat to producers. Of the 178 member countries in the World Organization for Animal Health, FMD is endemic in 96 of them. The swine industry has seen the introduction of diseases such as circovirus and enteric coronavirus most recently. The route of these diseases hasn't been confirmed, so there is concern that other diseases could come through those same pathway as these diseases. Classical swine fever, also known as hog cholera, is another highly contagious disease of pigs included in the SPS plan. CSF is also not a public health or food safety concern. The clinical signs listed here could be the same clinical signs we see for many of our endemic diseases, such as PERS or Salmonella. Because some CSF strains may produce these same signs, we need to remain vigilant as an industry. Although, at, although CSF was eradicated from the United States in 1978, it is still found in many areas of the world. As recently as 2009, Mexico had two small outbreaks, which were resolved using quarantines, stamping out, and disinfection. 
Therefore, CSF is still a disease threat to animals in the United States. The third disease included in the SPS plan is ASF. It is a highly contagious disease which infects only pigs. So while the highly virulent strain will cause a high death loss and may be more obvious to pig producers as more animals will be dying, the less virulent strain will more likely produce clinical signs similar to those of our endemic diseases, just as with CSF. As with FMD and CSF, ASF is not a public health or food safety concern. So while these numbers on your slide are not as earth shattering as those with FMD or ASF, or FMD or CSF, ASF prevalence in the world is increasing. In 2005, 20 countries had reported cases of ASF. This number increased to 30 countries during the 2013 to 2015 reporting period. The United States has never had a case of ASF, although nearby countries such as Cuba and the Dominican Republic has had infections as recently as the 1980s. In addition, ASF is not a great concern, excuse me, is a great concern because there is no vaccine um, for ASF. So in addition to their animals getting sick from these diseases and the foreign animal disease response that will be initiated, producers will also be impacted by the markets. When an FAD infects an animal in the United States, of course, export markets will be closed and the prices will plummet. Since 2008, exports of federally inspected pork and pork products from the United States consistently have ranged between 15 and 25 percent of the total production. So while the pork industry has really benefited financially from the increase in these exports, it will also be severely impacted when trade is cut off. Export markets may take much longer to return even after the outbreak is under control. This bar graph shows the difference between the time to regain freedom as recognized by the United States versus the OIE. So if you look at the bottom of the graph, you can see the outbreaks which occurred in different countries. And along the left side of the graph is the number of days. The time may, vary, may be very different than the time it takes to regain international recognition of disease freedom. So let's start by looking at Japan on the left in 2000. That outbreak, as represented by the blue color, um, lasted 64 days. And if you look at the red, that's the time that it took OIE to recognize disease freedom, which was 138 days. However, if you look at the green bar, that's the 606 days from the last case it took the United States to recognize disease freedom. And if you move on over another example, look at the United Kingdom in 2007. The outbreak lasted 63 days, and it was 144 days from the last case um, when the OIE recognized disease freedom versus 466 for the United States. So while I can understand why, I also would imagine that the United States may be treated the same way we treated our trading partners. So we may anticipate that the time from our Export until our exports resume may be much longer than it takes for the OIE to recognize disease freedom. So I said the last time the U.S. was infected with FMD was 1929 and 1978 with CSF. The animal industry has changed and is very different than it was even in 1978. So the disease response plans must change too. One of the challenges during an outbreak will be dealing with the large number of animals in today's current production facilities. Euthanizing and disposing of animals in these large sites will pose a difficult challenge. And as demonstrated as recently in High Path AI, disposing of one million birds from one site in a timely manner was not an easy task, much less when there's several sites infected or we're talking about larger animals. Another challenge is the volume of animal movement which will occur, which actually does occur every day in the United States. These movements include market animals to slaughter as well as animals being transported to the next stage of production. With approximately one million pigs on the road every day, a disease can transmit it around the country in a matter of days. 
because there is so much regular animal movement, rapid disease detection is essential to be able to contain an FAD outbreak. If FMD, CSF, or ASF is diagnosed in the U.S., there are disease response plans, as many as you know. The FAD FAD prep plans include the Red Book for both FMD and CSF, and there's a document called ASF Disease Response Strategies. These documents include the capabilities needed to respond as well as the critical activities needed. They cover five generally accepted strategies for the control and eradication of these diseases following an outbreak, including stamping out, stamping out with emergency vaccination to kill, to slaughter, or to live, and emergency vaccination to live without stamping out. The secure food supply plans are included as part of the emergency response to aid those herds which are affected by the response, but not infected by the disease. So in addition to those strategies I just mentioned, other tools include stop movement, biosecurity, trace back and trace forward of movements on and off the site, and utilizing diagnostics. How these tools are used may depend on the size of the outbreak. The FAD FAD prep strategy document covering the phases and types of FMD includes how the strategy utilizes, utilized during the outbreak will change as the outbreak progresses. The tools utilized during a, false, a small focal outbreak may be very different than those tools utilized during a large multi-state outbreak. In addition to the phases and types for FMD, we also have drafted guidelines for classification of phases and types of CSF and ASF. These documents have been um, distributed for review and are available on our website. You can see the link there. And we would welcome any input that anybody would provide on either one of those documents. So I'd like to take just a moment to highlight the information in these documents. Here is an example of the phases of the FMD response. The heightened alert phase is in play when FMD is diagnosed in either Mexico or Canada, but not yet in the United States. Phase one is the time from the first confirmed case until the extent of the outbreak is estimated. Phase two is the longer phase, and it's the time that we respond to the outbreak and we need to get it under control. Phase three is the recovery phase in which there is a plan in order to get the disease under control, and phase four is when we are actually free of the disease. So as I stated, the strategies for the response to and management of an FAD outbreak will change as the outbreak prog progresses and will depend on the magnitude, location, and other characteristics of the outbreak. This graphic depicts the six types which may be included in an FMD outbreak. They range starting on the bottom left with a small focal outbreak, and go all the way up the arrow if you follow it there to a large catastrophic North American outbreak, which of course includes Mexico and Canada. How the responsible regulatory officials handle that type one focal outbreak will likely vary greatly with the measures put in place with a type six outbreak. So now I'm gonna get into a little bit on the phases and types of FMD, CSF, and ASF. So all three of the documents that I had mentioned have four phases, but they do differ in their numbers of types. So why the differences? CSF and ASF infect only swine, of course, whereas FMD, as you know, affects cloven-hoofed animals. So while there will likely be a, de a delay in the availability of FMD CSF vaccine, vaccines will eventually be available to help the industries recover. However, as I stated, there's no vaccine for ASF which increases the importance of rapid detection and aggressive measures to stamp out infected herds. In addition, the virulence of the strain and the ability to detect them will dictate the extent of the outbreak. One of the tools I mentioned is the use of vaccines, so I just wanted to touch on that just briefly here. Um, FMD and CSF vaccine may be in short supply and not immediately available, and no vaccine is currently available as I stated for CSF, or for ASS, excuse me. Therefore, while vaccines may be a tool to be used during an outbreak, we must not rely on them exclusively, at least initially, and instead develop additional response strategies. 
So now I'm going to give a brief overview of the secure food supply plans and how they we are ensuring continuity amongst the plans. So the secure food supply plans are the result of discussions and work by an industry, state, federal, and academic partnership. So while the projects may be managed by academia, the guidance documents have been developed through input from all the partners on several different working groups. While each of the secure food supply plans have their own website, all can be accessed through the CFSPH website. So the secure food supply plans all have similar goals. They are to detect, control, and contain an FAD as quickly as possible, avoid interruptions in animal and animal product movement to commercial processing from farms with no evidence of infection during a foreign animal disease outbreak, and maintain business continuity for producers, transporters, food processors through response planning. So what exactly do I mean when I say business continuity planning? Business continuity in relation to the secure food supply plans is to have those discussions and make those plans which will allow the industry to continue the necessary components of their business to keep their businesses running and maintain, excuse me, and minimize the negative effects of their business while eradicating the disease. The disease needs to be controlled without destroying the industry in the process. The common components across the secure food supply plans include a voluntary pre-outbreak preparedness component, biosecurity, which we call enhanced biosecurity, uh, surveillance, epidemiology questionnaires, movement permits, and risk assessments. These plans must be based on current capabilities and will evolve with science, risk assessments, and new capabilities. So these are guidelines only, as the final decisions will be made by the responsible regulatory officials during the outbreak. The plans also include outreach and training pre and post outbreak. So now I'm going to dig a little bit deeper into the secure pork supply plan itself. So in many cases, swine production today involves a lot of animal movement. Weaned animals moving to nurseries or weaned to finished buildings finished animals to slaughter, breeding stock to sow farms. If healthy market weight animals are not allowed to move to slaughter, then weaned or nursery pigs cannot move into those finishing facilities and so on. The industry relies on these movements to occur. This is one reason the secure pork supply plan is so important. Animals caught in a control area under a stop movement that are affected but not infected need to be able to move under a permit or there will be serious welfare issues downstream. So that brings us to the goal of the Secure Pork Supply Plan, which is to develop procedures to allow the safe movement of animals with no evidence of infection in an FAD control area to a pork processing plant or to other sites to accommodate the different stages of production. Participation in the SPS plan is voluntary. These guidelines need to be practical for the industry so they can apply them, and credible to the responsible regulatory officials. In an actual outbreak, decisions will be made by those federal and state incident command officials based on the unique characteristics of each outbreak. As I stated with all the secure food supply plans, the secure pork supply plan is the result of discussions and work by an industry, state, federal, and academic partnership. The guidance documents have been developed through the input of working groups, two pilot projects, and the lessons learned from high path AI. As I discussed at the beginning of the presentation, there are three foreign animal diseases included in the Secure Pork Supply Plan, foot and mouth disease, classical swine fever, and African swine fever. And we like to always reinforce that these diseases are not a public health or food safety concern. So on day one of an outbreak, all exports will be stopped. Control areas will be set up to manage the movement, prices will drop, and consumer confidence will be at risk. A control area will consist of an infected zone, a buffer zone established around the known infected farms. A quarantine could be put in place for all operations housing susceptible animals, including cattle, pigs, sheep, goats, if the disease is FMD, or pigs only if the disease is CSF or ASF, and movement will occur only by permit. 
These movement controls will be in place until the SAD is eradicated and the control area is released. The secure food supply plan are for those herds that are affected by the quarantine and movement controls but not infected by the disease itself. So as the first case is diagnosed, no new animal movements will be initiated, but there will already be animals on the road. And this happens, so what happens to these animals in transit? So I know Dr. Bickett Weddle gave the same analogy, but it's one we like to use. Um, we use it in our guidelines to help people understand. We like to compare it to the planes landing during the 9-11 tragedy. So we're, again, we're not trying to make light of this tragic event, um, but the comparison does help people understand and think through the concept. So as the events of 9-11 began to unfold, new flights were not allowed to take off, and the planes in the air already needed to find a place to land. When one of these FADs is diagnosed in the United States, there will not be any new shipments of hogs allowed, and it has been estimated that around one million hogs are traveling somewhere in the U.S. at any given day. Some animals are being moved to slaughter to the next stage of production, as we've talked about, and all those animals need to land somewhere as the control areas are being established and the extent of the outbreaks determined. So while the extent of the outbreak of the events in 9-11 were being determined, no planes were allowed to take off. And that may be the case here too. So while the responsible regulatory officials are setting up the control areas and determining the extent of the outbreak, producers may have to sit tight as they may not be allowed to move animals for a period of time. After a few days, planes were allowed to take off again, but only under new security measures after they had been put in place. So for the livestock industries, movement will be allowed to resume, but only after enhanced biosecurity measures have been implemented, surveillance protocols are being followed, and under the stipulations of these movement permits I mentioned. So let's talk about movement permits. Many factors will go into the decision to issue a movement permit. For animals to be moved to another production site, the premises of destination would have to agree to accept the risk of receiving the animals. For the animals to move to slaughter, the owners of the slaughter facility would have to agree to accept the animals. In both cases, the site of origin would request the movement permit. Unified Incident Command officials would have to be willing to allow the animals to leave the premises and possibly the control area. State and animal health officials in the state of origin and the state of destination would have to agree that the animal movement would be allowed to occur. So now I'd like to take a couple minutes to discuss how the concept of controlled movement might be applied at the packing plant level. These animals on the road may have left what will become a control area. They may have been infected before they left but aren't showing any signs and may not have even tested positive by PCR. It is not possible to prove that a herd is negative, but it is possible to state that there is no evidence of infection. The same packing plant receiving these animals probably has received animals from this area for several days prior to the first herd being diagnosed. Therefore, the product would potentially contain the virus. However, the good news is that FMD is not a public health or food safety concern, so the product is safe to eat. We are very fortunate in the United States to be able to rely on employees with USDA's Food Safety and Inspection Service, or FSIS. Animals which pass anamortem and postmortem inspection by FSIS are considered safe for human consumption. As long as the animals are healthy and pass FSIS inspection, they are safe to eat and products should be able to enter commerce. So how does this apply to the beginning of an outbreak? Guidelines in the SPS plan are that animals in transit at the beginning of an outbreak should be allowed to continue to the packing plant to be processed. This especially applies to animals which cannot be turned back or euthanized while in transit. If the outbreak is determined to be a large outbreak, such as a type three or larger, if you remember from our graph, then pigs that are market weight from a farm with no evidence of infection would be allowed to move under permits to the packing plant for processing. It is better to be able to utilize these animals as protein for human consumption rather than have them continue to be at risk of getting infected by remaining in the control area. In addition, for those herds that do not become infected and that do become infected and recover, 
Those animals could also be sent to the packing plant once they are capable of passing FSIS inspection. Of course, consumer acceptance of the product would help determine if the packers would want to continue to process animals. Secure Beef and Secure Pork have been working together to communicate with packers both through our working groups and through the North American Meat Institute. We are hoping to address this gap in the Secure Pork Supply Plan. So I mentioned these animals moving from a control area under a permit. Operational permits may be required for those animals, um, for those daily movements needed to keep the operation running, such as feed trucks and manure movement. Um, business continuity permits may be required for the movements of the animals off the site. Several factors may influence whether or not a permit will be issued. How confident is the responsible regulatory official that the animals on the site are not infected? How large is the outbreak? If it's a small outbreak, officials might be less willing to permit those animals, whereas in a large outbreak, when more animals, when more animals are not infected but would be affected, officials might be more willing to permit those animals to move from a site in the control area. If the permit request is for animals to move between control areas, well, what is the status of the states in between? Is the final destination a control area, a slaughter facility, or a production site inside a control area or outside of a control area? Have the animals been vaccinated? What about moving those animals I mentioned earlier that were infected but now have recovered? What are the consequences of not allowing animals to move at all? Well, a lot of younger animals need to be euthanized. So these are a lot of things that the animal health officials will need to consider when deciding whether or not to issue those permits. So how can producers both protect the animals on their site from getting infected as well as implement the measures on their site to make the more likely to be able to receive a movement permit. We have an SPS plan summary available on our website, securepork.org. It is only a six-page document covering what producers will need to do to more likely receive a, a movement permit. Our original summary was really long and difficult to follow, so this version is much more concise and hopefully it, won't, it will be a lot easier to use during an animal health emergency. So as you can see here, different sections of the document link to existing government documents that describe how the response may be handled by the responsible regulatory officials. There are also links to the different components of the SPS plan, such as biosecurity, surveillance, and so on. So these existing documents have a lot of information, and by providing all these links, when those documents that they, the links connect to are updated, our plan will still remain current. So anytime we talk about the Secure Pork Supply Plan, one of the first things that we explain that is needed is the geographically distinct location having a nationally standardized premises identification number or PIN. The address for this PIN should be the location of the animals, not a separate business or housing location. Production records should also be maintained in an easily accessible electronic format so that producers can provide information to incident command officials on all the movements of animals onto and off of their premises within the last 28 hours. This will help officials trace back all animals arriving onto the premises and trace forward all animals having left the premises. Biosecurity is another component of the SPS plan. Biosecurity can be expensive and inconvenient. However, if the farm becomes infected with FMDCSF or ASF, it will also be very expensive and inconvenient to say the least. Swine producers already have biosecurity measures implemented on most farms. However, in many cases, these biosecurity measures are those that will help protect against endemic diseases, of which we have some herd immunity and lower levels of pathogen shedding. Enhanced biosecurity measures will be needed to help protect our herds against these foreign animal diseases, of which we have no herd immunity, and there will be a high level of pathogen shedding. So it will be up to the producer to try to protect their herd from the foreign animal disease at hand. On our website, we have a biosecurity self-assessment checklist. The enhanced biosecurity recommendations outlined in this document are based on known exposure routes um, for the three FADs of concern. And, and note that this list is for animals raised indoors. We are working on documents for animals raised outdoors also. 
the enhanced biosecurity checklist, and as you see here, the corresponding information manual for enhanced biosecurity can be used to develop a site-specific written enhanced biosecurity plan. I'm finishing up the revisions to that information manual, and it should be on our website before the end of the year. When we send it out for review, we've got lots of great comments I'm working on. And the biosecurity checklist and information manual for enhanced biosecurity emphasizes the four concepts you see here that all pork production sites must implement to help protect their animals from endemic diseases and do to be prepared in the event of an FAD outbreak. They include the biosecurity manager, a written site-specific biosecurity plan, a defined perimeter buffer area, and a defined line of separation. So now let's break down each of these four concepts. A lesson learned from the high path AI outbreaks is that we needed to make sure biosecurity measures are being followed on the site. All the secure food supply plans are adding a biosecurity manager. The biosecurity manager needs to have an understanding of infectious diseases, production animal agriculture, and be, be familiar with the facility. He or she will use the self-assessment checklist and information manual to write the site-specific biosecurity plan. We're also working on some templates that it can be used too. Employees will need to be trained in biosecurity, and the biosecurity manager would ensure that that training takes place. This individual would be someone at the site who can monitor the compliance. So who can be a biosecurity manager? Well, it can be the owner or manager of a site, a veterinarian, or an employee on the site. If a site has one biosecurity manager for multiple, or a system has one biosecurity manager for multiple sites within their system, then the on-site manager is responsible to ensure that the biosecurity measures for the site are followed. The site-specific biosecurity plan that I just mentioned needs to explain how the site has implemented the biosecurity measures listed in the checklist. It must include a site map, as you can see here, with several items that need to be included on the map, such as parking, the perimeter buffer area, and the line of separation. For animals housed indoors, the area around the buildings is the perimeter buffer area, or PBA, where human and vehicle traffic have taken steps to mitigate the potential for contamination. This PBA was a concept of Jim McKean. He was very passionate that the second line of defense would increase, excuse me, would decrease viral load and help reduce the risk of virus entering the building. Crossing the PBA should occur only through PBA access points. So these PBA access points are designated areas where people, animals, equipment, or vehicles, or supplies, can cross into the PBA. Specific biosecurity measures must be followed, which include anything like cleaning and disinfecting vehicles, equipment, putting on disposable boots to those that can be disinfected when crossing into the PBA. So an essential component for improved biosecurity is to implement a barrier, separating dirtier potential sources of infection from clean areas. This barrier is called the line of separation, or LOS, and for animals housed indoors, the LOS are the walls of the building. The purpose of the LOS is to prevent movement of these viruses into the buildings where susceptible animals would be exposed. Crossing the LOS should occur only through LOS access points that require following appropriate biosecurity measures. So the LOS access points are designated areas, again, where people, equipment, or supplies cross the LOS, very similar to the concept for the PBA. Movement through the LOS access points in either direction requires instituting appropriate biosecurity measures. Movement of equipment and supplies across the LOS requires cleaning and disinfecting at the access point. Movement of people through the LOS access point requires following specific biosecurity measures. So some examples of those biosecurity measures which need to be implemented at the LOS access point may include things like showering, if showering facilities are available, washing hands and changing into site-specific coveralls or clothing and footwear, disinfecting items which cross the LOS, or in cases where those items come from a clean known source, possible double packing, as demonstrated in the photo on the lower left, is acceptable too. Now I'm going to go over just a couple examples of what this might look like. We have to remember that the 
TBA, the location of the TBA and LOS may vary depending on the site layout. Sites can be very different. While the LOS is made up of the walls of the building, the location of the LOS access point may vary. In this example, one employee LOS access point is available, you can see there, um, for employee entry, and enclosed walkways between the building allow the employees to move freely between the buildings. If you look to your left, you can see a C and D station by the PBA access point. And in this case, feed trucks will be able to access the site without C and D as long as they do not cross into that PBA. That drive should be considered uh, as possibly contaminated. Another example is this setup here with four finishing buildings. Usually the finishing buildings do not allow a lot of space at the entry. So it's hard for an employee to take a lot of biosecurity measures right as they walk into the building. So in this example, a small employee building was added to the top of the graphic. Employees can follow biosecurity measures such as showering or hand washing and applying site-specific clothing or coveralls and, and footwear in that building, then come out the door into the PBA and walk to the finishing buildings as long as they stay within that PBA. However, when they enter the building to cross into the LOS, the employees then need to take, change footwear, possibly wash hands, uh, apply hand sanitizer, and so on. Employees, employees need to train in biosecurity, and that's essential in order to increase compliance. Employees need to understand what is expected of them in basic biosecurity concepts. So here's just an example of one of four biosecurity training modules that we developed. Each module is under five minutes in length, can be watched individually or in a group setting, something like an employee meeting. Um, employees can then take a quiz. We added additional questions, so there's several versions of the quiz for group training. The questions in order, the questions in order of the questions are changed up when the quizzes are taken online. So the quizzes and certificates can be used by the biosecurity manager if they choose to as part of their biosecurity training. Just one more resource is all. So this is a new concept that's been proposed called a pre-movement isolation period for sites moving animals to another stage of production. An example might be if I were moving breeding animals from a site in a control area onto my swine operation. However, I also want to move my weaned pigs off to another stage of production. For seven days before my weaned pigs are allowed to move, I cannot bring my new breeding animals onto my site. That way I can observe my animals for those seven days to make sure that there's no clinical signs without worrying about new animals coming on my site and possibly um, infecting any of my animals. So once um, the weaned animals are moved, then I can bring on my new breeding animals. And this concept doesn't apply to animals moving to slaughter. And we always welcome input on, on that concept. We've been out discussing it and, and always are looking for feedback. Biosecurity posters we also have available on our website as a PDF in both English and Spanish. They cover biosecurity measures which could be followed by both producers and their employees as well as visitors coming to the site. Producers can order these laminated copies um, of the wall charts to post in their buildings from the pork store. Let's talk surveillance. So surveillance guidance documents have been circulated, as Dr. Bickett Weddle mentioned, for dairy and beef. We are currently working on a draft for secure pork. These documents explore the potential surveillance options and methods for evidence of FMD virus infection on beef and dairy operations in an FMD control area, the surveillance for designation as a monitor premise, and surveillance for animal movement permits. On the next few slides, I'm going to cover a few possible options that might be included on the pig side. Surveillance may include both testing and observation, depending on the size of the outbreak. Samples may be collected and tested. Veterinarians may need to observe animals prior to loading to ensure no clinical signs are evident. In addition, the producers may be asked to have a site employee document animal observations daily on the site. These individuals would be called herd health monitors and would be trained to look for specific clinical signs by watching videos and understanding a little more what they're looking for. Then they would document their daily observations. The sampling protocols have not been established for FMD, CSF, and AS 
F testing in pigs. In a large outbreak when animal health officials' resources would be stressed, it would be ideal if producers under the guidance of their veterinarian could collect their own samples. Utilizing ropes to collect oral fluid samples as producers are doing right now for endemic diseases like PERS. Um, PCR testing of clinical animals is valuable to detect the presence, the presence of infection. And rope testing would allow for a large number of animals to be tested at one time. So I discussed observations. Observations by either an accredited veterinarian or a designated individual on the site would be important. And we've developed several modules to help train these individuals on what clinical signs to look for. In addition, we have information available on how to collect oral fluids and just finished up materials on how to collect nasal swabs in the event these samples would be those um, utilized depending on the size of the outbreak in which FAD we're testing for. And you can see there the oral fluid collection um, deliverables and the nasal swab material um, will be up on the website soon. In addition to the modules, we utilized some wonderful pictures taken at Plum Island Animal Disease Center to put together a foot and mouth disease pocket guide with domestic swine on one side and feral swine on the other. We also have that same pocket guide translated to Spanish. And those are available as PDFs on our website. We also put together three disease wall charts for FMD, CSF, and ASF. These wall charts are laminated so they can be disinfected and hung in the barns for animal caretakers to see on a daily basis so that they can be reminded of the clinical signs associated with each of these diseases. The National Pork Board would be happy to send them to producers free of charge in an effort to get as many of them as they can into the barns as possible. For the epidemiology questionnaire, we have included the FMD Epi questionnaire from the FMD Red Book. We included it on the website so that producers could look at the type of information they may need to provide during an outbreak. That way, they will know what kind of information they will need to keep track of. Another topic that we started to address and develop draft documents for are the factors to consider when an outbreak is too large to control with stamping out and the infected premises needs to be managed. Movement needs to continue on these sites, such as feed delivery, while preventing the virus from leaving the premises and infecting other pigs. Sick pigs will need to be managed with antibiotics for secondary infections, pain medications, or anti-inflammatories. Those animals which are severely infected may need to be euthanized and discussions need to occur about at what point the recovered animals would pass FSIS inspection and could be marketed. Secure milk, beef, and pork are working together when drafting these documents. <clears throat> so we utilized a couple pilot projects for the Secure Pork Supply Plan. And, and during one of those projects, or our second pilot project, we utilized this separate web page for producers and it laid out the steps for producers to follow in order to implement the secure pork supply plan on their site. We are looking into the possibility of utilizing this on a national level as we have producers wondering about the steps that they need to take to implement secure pork on their production site. So in addition, we've utilized a web page for the animal health officials during that pilot project also. It included the steps um, for the animal health officials could follow if they're approached by producers in their state who want to implement secure pork on their site. So we're exploring this option too as we move forward with SPS plan implementation on pork production sites. So as I've mentioned, uh, many of the documents that we discussed today will be available on our Secure Pork Supply website at securepork.org. Um, some of them are still being updated, some of the materials, and we hope to get a lot of them up before the end of the year here. And I just wanted to share with you a photo one of my eight-year-olds took of an owl on our place, and I want to thank you for allowing me to share the Secure Pork Supply Plan with you today, and I would be happy to try to answer any questions you might have. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, as we move into Q&A, please feel free to place yourselves in the question queue by pressing pound 2 on your telephone keypad. 
Voice over computer users can select the raise hand emoticon from the top toolbar. You'll hear a notification when your line is unmuted, at which point please send state your name and question. You are still welcome to submit written questions, and these can be sent in using the participants menu at the top of your screen and opting to send note to all presenters. If you're logged in using the web-based application, use the notes function on the lower right-hand side of your screen and address your notes to all moderators. All right, at this time, I'm not showing any questions. And if anyone has any questions at a later time um, or would like to be a part of reviewing the documents for the Secure Pork Supply Plan, feel free to email me. My last name is Abel, Z-A-A-B-E-L, the letter P for Pam at iastate.edu. And this uh, webinar, it will be recorded and we'll be sending out um, the actual uh, slot where you can review the, the webinar. And I don't see any questions at this time either. Um, so I guess what I'd, I'd like to thank you very much for um, participating and thank you um, Dr. Zabel. I just also want to let um, everyone that's still on the line know that we will have another um, Secure Food Supply Plan webinar on January 24th at 11 o'clock Eastern Standard. Uh, Dr. Fred Bourgeois will be presenting on permitting and uh, emergency management response system. And with that, I think we'll say have a good afternoon. <laughs>